Ephesians chapter 1, beginning with verse 1, and it reads, Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ by the will of God to the saints which are at Ephesus and to the faithful in Christ Jesus, grace be to you and peace from God our Father and from the Lord Jesus Christ. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who hath blessed us with all spiritual blessings in heavenly places in Christ. Now, Paul states here that he was an apostle, which is the highest office in the church with supreme authority. And it was by the will of God. He was chosen and ordained as an apostle by God. Then he addressed the saints at Ephesus. Then he begins to share with them some wonderful things. He says here, we have been blessed with all, not some, not a few, not a lot, but with all spiritual blessings in heavenly places in Christ. We are complete in him. Everything that is needed to be like him, we already possess. All we must do is to grow to maturity in him. All right, look at verse 4. According as he had chosen us in him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and without blame before him in love. God chose us in him. He chose us to be saved before Genesis 1 and 1 in eternity past. And his purpose for choosing us was to show forth holiness and for us to live a life above reproach so that the world can see him. I look at verse number five. Having predestinated us unto the, the adoption of children by Jesus Christ to himself according to the good pleasure of his will. Now, God planned before the foundation of the world for us to be his children. Oh, that's good news. And he did it because he wanted to do it. He took pleasure in doing so. That's enough to give him praise and glory from eternity to eternity. Amen. Look at verse 6. To the praise of the glory of his grace, wherein he had made us accepted in the beloved. God has performed a threefold work. He has chosen us in Christ. He predestinated us to the place of sonship. And he has made us accepted in the beloved, Jesus Christ. And it is all because of God's grace. Verse 7, in whom we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins according to the riches of his grace. Now, forgiveness depends and demands on the payment of the penalty for sin. Christ's debt and the shedding of his blood is the foundation for forgiveness. And without that, there could be no forgiveness. Jesus paid the penalty for our sins on the cross and said three of the most powerful words recorded in scripture and that is it is finished and because of his shed blood we were redeemed and forgiven of all our sins according to the riches of his grace verse 8 wherein he had abounded toward us in all wisdom and prudence having made known unto us the mystery of his will, according to his good pleasure, which he had purposed in himself, that in the dispensation of the fullness of times he might gather together in one all things in Christ, both which are in heaven and which are on earth, even in him, in whom also we have obtained an inheritance, being predestinated according to the purpose of him, who worketh all things after the counsel of his own will, that we should be to the praise of his glory, who first trusted in Christ, in whom ye also trusted, after that ye heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, in whom also after that ye believed, ye were sealed with that Holy Spirit of promise, which is the earnest of our inheritance, until the redemption of the purchased possession unto the praise of his glory. Now, because of God's grace, we heard the gospel. We believed and we were sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise. The purpose of the sealing work of the Holy Spirit 
is to denote rightful ownership. 2 Timothy chapter 2 and verse 19 says this, Nevertheless, the foundation of God standeth sure. Having this seal, the Lord knoweth them that are his, and let every one that nameth the name of Christ depart from iniquity. God, listen, God recognizes us by his seal, which is the Holy Spirit. And the Holy Spirit is our guarantee that we will receive our glorified bodies and also that we will forever be with the Lord. Praise and glory be to God the Father. Oh, hallelujah. Look at verse number 15. Wherefore I also, after I heard of your faith in the Lord Jesus and love unto all the saints, cease not to give thanks for you, making mention of you in my prayers, that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give unto you the spirit of wisdom and revelation in the knowledge of him, the eyes of your understanding being enlightened, that ye may know what is the hope of his calling and what the riches of the glory of his inheritance in the saints and what is the exceeding greatness of his power to us who believe according to the working of his mighty power. Listen, God wants us to excel in his wisdom. God wants us to excel in revelation in the knowledge of him. God wants us to excel in understanding. The Bible says in Proverbs chapter 4 and verse 7, Wisdom is the principal thing, therefore get wisdom. And with all thy getting, get understanding. Why? That we may know what is the hope of his calling. And that we may know the exceeding greatness of his power. Woo, glory to God. Now, just how great is his power? Hmm? Let's look at verse 20 which he wrought in Christ when he raised him from the dead and set him at his own right hand in the heavenly places, far above all principality and power and might and dominion and every name that is named, not only in this world, but also in that which is to come and had put all things under his feet and gave him to be the head over all things to the church which is his body, the fullness of him that fill it all in all. Listen, God's incredible power raised Jesus Christ from the dead and seated him to the place of honor at his right hand in heaven. God the Father has honored Jesus Christ beyond measure. Jesus Christ is our head and he has filled us, which is the church, with himself. Glory to God, glory to God. Look at chapter 2, verse 1. And you had he quickened who were dead in trespasses and sins, where in time past ye walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that now worketh in the children of disobedience, among whom also we all had our conversation in times past in the lusts of our flesh, fulfilling the desires of the flesh and of the mind, and were by nature the children of wrath, even as others. But God, but God, underline that, but God, who is rich in mercy, for his great love, wherewith he loved us, even when we were dead in sins, hath quickened us together with Christ. By grace ye are saved. And had raised us up together and made us sit together in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. That in the ages to come he might show the exceeding riches of his grace in his kindness toward us through Jesus Christ. Listen, once upon a time we were bound by the sin master. We were doomed, destined for hell. But God, but God who is rich in mercy, came on the scene of debt and doomness with his mercy and brought about a radical change. He saved us, he redeemed us, he filled us with his precious spirit and placed us into his family. When Jesus rose, we rose and we are sitting in heavenly places 
in Christ Jesus. Our citizenship is in heaven. And he did all of this in order that he might show in the ages to come the exceeding, overflowing, intense riches of his grace in kindness toward us in Christ. Oh, that's enough to give God praise forever. My God, my God. Look at verse number eight. For by grace are ye saved through faith, and that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. We received salvation by God's grace through faith. We had nothing to do with it. It was a gift from God the Father to us, leaving no room for anyone to boast. God did it all. Verse number 10. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus unto good works, which God had before ordained that we should walk in them. Listen, we have been handpicked by God to produce a life that is pleasing to him. God's gift of salvation to us should cause us to be so grateful to him by seeking with our whole hearts to live the kind of life that will bring joy to his heart. Look at verse 11. Wherefore remember that ye being in time past Gentiles in the flesh who are called uncircumcision by that which is called the circumcision in the flesh made by hands that at that time ye were without Christ being aliens from the commonwealth of Israel and strangers from the covenants of promise having no hope and without God in the world but now but now but now in Christ Jesus ye who sometimes were far off are made nigh by the blood of Christ. Paul tells the Gentiles, believers at Ephesus, to remember how at one time they were identified as the uncircumcision by the Jews who believed in and, and practiced uh, circumcision. And how they were once lost without Christ in their lives. And how they were alienated from the citizenship of Israel. And how they used to be strangers from the covenants of promise. God had made certain promises to the nation Israel that he did not make with any other nation. And he reminds them how they used to be without hope and without God in the world. That was then. But this is now. Now in Christ Jesus, we who was afar off are made nigh by the blood of Christ. Oh, that's good news. Look at verse number 14. For he is our peace, who had made both one and had broken down the middle wall of petition between us, having abolished in his flesh the intimacy, uh, even the law of commandments contained in ordinances. For to make in himself of twain one new man so making peace, and that he might reconcile both unto God in one body by the cross, having slain the intimacy thereby, and came and preached peace to you which were afar off, and to them that were nigh. Jesus Christ, who is our peace, has made peace between the Jews and Gentiles. The middle wall, the fence or partition, the intimacy between the two has been broken down. The body of Jesus Christ now consists of both Jews and Gentiles. We are all one in Jesus Christ. We are all equal in the eyes of God. Verse 18. For through him we both have access by one spirit unto the Father. And this is a very powerful verse. This verse contains the Trinity. It says here, For through him, which is Jesus Christ, we both, which is the Jews and Gentiles, have access in one spirit. That's the Holy Spirit unto the Father, God the Father. Got it? The Trinity. All right. Every believer has access to the throne of God the Father through Jesus Christ. Look at verse number 19. Now therefore ye are no more strangers and foreigners, but fellow citizens with the saints and of the household of God, and are built upon the foundation of the apostles and prophets, Jesus Christ himself being the chief cornerstone, in whom all the building fitly framed together 
grow it unto an holy temple in the Lord, in whom ye also are built together for an habitation of God through the Spirit. Now Paul makes it plain here that the Jews and Gentiles in Christ are equal. The Gentiles are no longer strangers and foreigners to God. The Gentile Christians along with the Jewish Christians are one, and together we are built upon the foundation of the apostles and prophets of God. And Jesus Christ is our chief cornerstone, and the Spirit of God is at home in the body of Jesus Christ. Oh, glory to God, glory to God. Chapter 3, verse 1. For this cause, I, Paul, the prisoner of Jesus Christ for you Gentiles, if ye have heard of the dispensation of the grace of God which is given to me to you would, how that by revelation he made known unto me the mystery as I wrote afore in few words, whereby when ye read ye may understand my knowledge in the mystery of Christ, which in other ages was not made known unto the sons of men, as it is now revealed unto his holy apostles and prophets by the Spirit that the Gentiles should be fellow heirs of the same body and partakers of his promise in Christ by the gospel. Listen, Paul's primary purpose in life was to bring the gospel to the Gentiles. Then he talks about the mystery that he received by revelation. Now, what is the mystery? The mystery was that the Gentiles and Israel were placed on the same plane. By faith in Christ, they both were brought into a new body, which is the church. Verse number seven. Wherefore, I was made a minister according to the gift of the grace of God, given unto me by the effectual working of his power. Unto me, who am less than the least of all saints, is this grace given, that I should preach among the Gentiles the unsearchable riches of Christ, and to make all men see what is the fellowship of the mystery, which from the beginning of the world had been hid in God, who created all things by Jesus Christ. Now, Paul was a man who walked in humility. Here he says that he is less than the least of all saints. In 1 Corinthians chapter 15 and verse 9, he says that he is the least of the apostles and didn't deserve to be one because he persecuted the church of God. But because of God's mercy, a mighty revolution took place in the life of Paul. He was chosen to preach among the Gentiles the unsearchable riches of Christ, and he made known to all men the fellowship of the mystery. Verse number 10. To the intent that now unto the principalities and powers in heavenly places might be known by the church the manifold wisdom of God, according to the eternal purpose which he purposed in Christ Jesus our Lord. Now, another purpose of the mystery is revealed here. God's created intelligence are learning something of the wisdom of God through the church. They not only see the love of God displayed and lavished upon us, but the wisdom of God is revealed to his angels by the church. Isn't that wonderful? That is awesome. That's awesome. Look at verse 12. In whom we have boldness and access with confidence by the faith of him. In other words, because of what Jesus has done for us, we now can come boldly before the throne of God with confidence that he always hear us. And not only do he hear our prayers, but answer them also. We now through Jesus Christ have access into the holy of holies, right straight to the throne of God, the Father. Oh, that's all right with me. Look at verse 13. Wherefore I desire that ye faint not, at my tribulations for you, which is your glory. For this cause I bow my knees unto the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, of whom the whole family in heaven and earth is named. Now Paul tells them here not to allow the things that he's going through for them to cause them to give up. And then he says, I'm going to pray for you to to keep you from falling. Hallelujah. Then Paul shows us a view of God's family. God's family consists of us 
the believers, the church, and his holy angels. Isn't that wonderful? Glory to God. Look at verse 16. That he will grant you according to the riches of his glory to be strengthened with might by his spirit in the inner man. That Christ may dwell in your hearts by faith. That ye being rooted and grounded in love may be able to comprehend with all saints what is the breadth and length and depth and height. And to know the love of Christ which passeth knowledge that ye might be filled with all the fullness of God. Listen, Paul prays here for the spiritual aspect of the Ephesian believers. He prayed that their inner man would be strengthened. He prayed that Christ would be at home in their hearts. He wanted them to be rooted and grounded in love so that they would be able to understand and to truly know the depthness of God's love and experience it in this life and thus be filled with all the fullness of God because God is love. And the more we walk in his love, the more we become like him. Why? Because God is love. Verse number 20. Now unto him that is able to do exceeding abundantly above all that we ask or think, according to the power that worketh in us, unto him be glory in the church by Christ Jesus throughout all ages, world without end. Amen. Now, the Living Bible says it best. Let me read it from the Living Bible. It says, Now glory be to God, who by his mighty power at work within us is able to do far more than we would ever dare to ask or even dream of, infinitely beyond our highest prayers, desires, thoughts, or hopes. May he be given glory forever and ever through endless ages because of his master plan of salvation for the church through Jesus Christ. Ooh, that's beautiful. My God, my God. What a powerful way to conclude a prayer. Hmm? My God. Let's look at chapter 4, verse 1. I therefore, the prisoner of the Lord, beseech you that ye walk worthy of the vocation wherewith ye are called. Now, Paul says here, in light of all I have said in the first three chapters of this letter, I beg you to walk worthy of your calling. And then he tells us how to walk worthy of our calling. Look at verse number two. With all lowliness and meekness, with long suffering, forbearing one another in love, endeavoring to keep the unity of the spirit in the bond of peace. Now here Paul gives us the things we must do in order to walk worthy of our calling. Number one, with all, we must walk with all lowliness. Lowliness means a mind brought low. It is the opposite of pride. Lowliness characterized our Lord Jesus Christ. He says this in Matthew chapter 11 and verse 29. Take my yoke upon you and learn of me for I am meek and lowly in heart. Number two, we must walk with all meekness. Meekness means a willingness to stand and do the will of God regardless of the cost. Meekness causes you to have a righteous indignation against sin. Meekness in action is defending the truth at all costs. Number three, long suffering. Long suffering is a long temper, meaning it takes a long time to make angry. Number four is forbearing one another in love. Listen, Christians must have the patience toward one another which God has shown, amen, to us. Now, number five, endeavoring to keep the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. That's wonderful. Verse number four, there is one body and one Spirit, even as ye are called in one hope of your calling. One Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all, who is above all and through all and in you all. Now, one body refers to all believers from Pentecost to the rapture. One spirit is the Holy Spirit who baptizes each believers into the body of Christ. One hope of your calling refers to our hope 
of receiving our glorified bodies. One Lord refers to the Lord Jesus Christ. One faith refers to the truth given to the apostles by Jesus Christ himself. One baptism refers to the baptism of the Holy Spirit. One God and Father of all refers to God's fatherhood of all believers only. He is not the father of unbelievers. Sonship comes only through Jesus Christ. God the Father is the father of all who are his by regeneration. Verse number seven. But unto every one of us is given grace according to the measure of the gift of Christ. Wherefore he said, when he ascended up upon high, he led captivity captive and gave gifts unto men. Now that he ascended, what is it but that he also descended first into the lower parts of the earth? He that descended is the same also that ascended up far above all heavens, that he might fill all things. And he gave some apostles and some prophets and some evangelists, and some pastors and teachers, for the perfecting of the saints, for the work of the ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ, till we all come in the unity of the faith, and of the knowledge of the Son of God, unto a perfect man, unto the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ, that we henceforth be no more children tossed to and fro, and carried about with every wind of doctrine, by the slate of men, and cunning craftiness, whereby they lie in wait to deceive. Now, Jesus has given every believer a gift or gifts, special abilities out of his rich storehouse of gifts, and he has distributed them according to his will. Some believers only have one gift, while others uh, may have two, and where, whereas others may have three or four. But nevertheless, every believer have at least one special ability given to them by Jesus Christ. And when every believer functions in the gift or gifts God has given them, the body of Christ functions well. Also, God has set in order the fivefold ministry consisting of both men and women in the body of Christ to develop believers from babyhood to full maturity. All right, look at verse number 15. But speaking the truth in love may grow up into him in all things which is the head, even Christ, from whom the whole body fitly joined together and compacted by that which every joint supplied, according to the effectual working in the measure of every part, make it increase of the body unto the edifying of itself in love. Now, we see here the importance of every member functioning in their right place. When every believer functions in their proper place, the body grows and flourishes in love. Functioning outside of your proper place in the body of Christ causes the body to become dysfunctional. It is imperative that every member of the body of Jesus Christ function in their proper place. I look at verse number 17. This I say therefore and testify in the Lord that ye henceforth walk not as other Gentiles walk in the vanity of their mind, having the, having the understanding darkened, being alienated from the life of God through the ignorance that is in them, because of the blindness of their heart, who being past feelings have given themselves over unto lasciviousness to work all uncleanness with greediness. But ye have not so learned Christ, if so be that ye have heard him and have been taught by him as the truth is in Jesus, that ye put off concerning the former conversation the old man, which is corrupt according to the deceitful lusts, and be renewed in the spirit of your mind, and that ye put on the new man, which after God is created in righteousness and true holiness. Now, Paul says here that we are not to go and pick up some of the sins we used to commit. We are not to go back to our old ways, but we are to walk in the spirit. We are to live a life that is according to our new nature. We are a new creation in Christ and we are to act like it. We have to continue to renew or refresh our minds of who we really are. Listen, the battleground is in the mind. The enemy throws many darts which are, which, which are ungodly thoughts at our minds. Therefore, we have to constantly renew our minds, keep our minds focused on the good word of God so that our spirit man will stay on track. 
All right, look at verse 25. Wherefore, putting away lying, speak every man truth with his neighbor, for we are members of one another. Be ye angry and sin not. Let not the sun go down upon your wrath. Now, Paul tells the, 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 the Ephesian believers to stop lying. Just that simple. Stop telling lies. He instructs them to be truthful to everyone. Then he instructs them not to allow their anger to cause them to sin. Quickly resolve whatever needs to be resolved and walk back in harmony with your brothers and sisters in Christ or with your husband or wife. Verse 27. Neither give place to the devil. Never let up on the spiritual battlefield. Never take a step backward. Don't allow the enemy to gain a single yard. Always keep the devil on his heels. Listen, if you give him an inch, he will take a mile. Don't give him nothing to work with. Verse 28. Let him that stole steal no more, but rather let him labor, working with his hands, the thing which is good that he may have to give to him that need it. Listen, righteous living consists of honest labor for the things you obtain in life. He says here to the Ephesian believers, stop stealing, get a job, and take care of your needs and the needs of others. Verse 29, let no corrupt communication proceed out of your mouth, but that which is good to the use of edifying, that it may minister grace unto the hearers. Listen. At no given time are we to speak things that are displeasing to God. Every time we open our mouths should be to edify. And if we do this, we will always find ourselves ministering grace to the hearers. Verse 30. And grieve not the Holy Spirit of God, whereby ye are sealed unto the day of redemption. Now he says here not to grieve the Holy Spirit of God. Now, how do a person grieve the Holy Spirit? A person can grieve the Holy Spirit by lying, stealing, being lazy, and not working, and so on. And why shouldn't we grieve the Holy Spirit? The reason why we shouldn't is because the Holy Spirit seals us until the day when he will present us to the Lord Jesus Christ. Verse 31, that all bitterness and wrath and anger and clamor and evil speaking be put away from you with all malice and be ye kind one to another, tender hearted, forgiving one another, even as God for Christ's sake hath forgiven you. Now, Paul tells us what not to do and what to do. He gives us here some principles for Christian living. We are to be kind, tender hearted, always with one another. And we are to always forgive one another. Chapter 5, verse 1. Be therefore followers of God as dear children. And walk in love as Christ also had loved us and had given himself for us an offering and a sacrifice to God for a sweet smelling savor. Now, every believer is to be an imitator of God in every aspect. We are to act like God in every area of our lives. Verse 3. But fornication and all uncleanness and all or covetousness, let it not be once named among you as becoming saints. Neither filthiness, nor foolish talking, nor jesting which is joking, which are not convenient, but rather giving of thanks. For this ye know that no whoremonger, no unclean person, no covetous man who is an idolater hath any inheritance in the kingdom of Christ and of God. Let no man deceive you with vain words. For because of these things cometh the wrath of God upon the children of disobedience. Be not ye therefore partakers with them. For ye were sometimes darkness, but now are ye light in the Lord. Walk as children of light. For the fruit of the Spirit is in all goodness and righteousness and truth, proving what is acceptable unto the Lord. Now listen, fornication, all uncleanness, covetousness, filthiness, foolish talking, joking, shouldn't be heard of among God's people. We are not to be partakers of unrighteousness. We are the light of the world, and we are to live our lives according, accordingly. Paul identifies the fruit of light. He marks out those characteristics which always accompany light, and that is in all goodness, righteousness, and truth. 
And if you apply these characteristics to your life, you will have a life that is acceptable and well-pleasing to God. Look at verse number 11. And have no fellowship with the unfruitful works of darkness, but rather reprove them. For it is a shame even to speak of those things which are done of them in secret. But all things that are reproved are made manifest by the light. For whatsoever do it make manifest is light. Wherefore he said, Awake thou that sleepest, and arise from the dead, and Christ shall give you light. Now, we are not to have any part in any ungodly activities, but rather reprove them. In other words, we are to convict them. How do we convict sinners? Here it is. The light of a believer's life rebukes the works of darkness. Did you get that? The light of a believer's life rebukes the works of darkness. All right, verse 15. See then that ye walk circumspectly, not as fools, but as wise, redeeming the time because the days are evil. Wherefore, be ye not unwise, but understanding what the will of the Lord is. Now, every believer is to walk wisely, making the best use of our time, for we are living in a terrible time. We are living in a time or day where sin is constantly on the horizon. Our walk ought to reveal the urgency of the hour and the importance of living for God. Paul lets us know that wisdom gives us the understanding of what the will of the Lord is. It is imperative that we be wise children of God. Verse 18, and be not drunk with wine wherein is excess, but be filled with the Spirit, speaking to yourselves in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making melody in your heart to the Lord, giving thanks always for all things unto God and the Father in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, submitting yourselves one to another in the fear of God. We are not to be filled up with wine but rather be filled with the Spirit, filling ourselves up with God on a daily basis by speaking to ourselves in psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs, making melody in our hearts to the Lord. And we are to always give thanks for everything to God the Father in the name of Jesus Christ. In other words, our relationship with God should grow closer and stronger every day. And then he instructs us to submit ourselves one to another in the fear of God. Now, you hardly ever hear a Christian husband quoting Ephesians chapter 5 and verse 21. We must submit to each other. This includes husbands and wives submitting to one another. There is to be a mutual submission within every marriage. Look at verse number 22. Wives, submit yourselves unto your own husbands as unto the Lord. For the husband is the head of the wife, even as Christ is the head of the church, and he is Savior of the body. Therefore, as the church is subject unto Christ, so let the wives be to their own husbands in everything. Husbands, love your wives, even as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for it, that he might sanctify and cleanse it with the washing of water by the word that he might present it to himself a glorious church not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing but that it should be holy and without blemish so ought men to love their wives even that as their own bodies he that loveth his wife loveth himself for no man ever yet hated his own flesh but nourished it and cherished it even as the lord the church for we are members of his body, of his flesh, and of his bones. For this cause shall a man leave his father and mother, and shall be joined unto his wife, and they too shall be one flesh. This is a great mystery, but I speak concerning Christ and the church. Nevertheless, let every one of you in particular so love his wife, even as himself, and the wife see that she reverence her husband. I believe that love and submission works hand in hand. Jesus set the tone for his relationship with the church. He sold love and submission. He sold love and submission by leaving his throne in glory, coming all the way down, bypassing the angels to the earth, and took on a form of flesh. He suffered in the flesh so that he could feel 
what we feel. That is why he is touched with the feelings of our infirmities. His infinite love for us caused him to prefer us over himself. Our sins that he bared caused him temporary separation from the Father, which was the most painful experience he had to endure. So painful so that he cried in the garden, Father, if it be possible, let this cup pass from me, but nevertheless your will be done. He submitted to the will of the Father. And because he submitted to the will of the Father, he was able to sow sacrificial love. He was able to endure all the agony of sufferings for us. Jesus loves us. He cherishes us. He nourishes us. He adores us. He gave his life for us. He protects us. And he preferred us over himself. Now, what did he reap? He sowed all this. What did he reap? What are he what is it that he that he is continuing to reap? Paul says here in verse 24 that the church is subject unto Christ. Now what does that mean? It means that the church in turn loves him, cherishes him, adores him, prefers him above everything else. And many Christians have even given their lives for him. Many have died for the faith. Jesus continues to love us. He continues to cherish us, to, to adore us, to protect us. He intercedes constantly to the Father on our behalf. And we, the church, in turn, continues to love, to cherish, to adore, and to reverence Him. What an awesome relationship. Jesus and the church is the pattern for Christian marriages. I say Jesus and the church is the pattern for Christian marriages marriages. The husband like Jesus must set the tone in the married relationship. He must first of all submit to the will of the father. By submitting to the will of the father he will be able to love his wife with a sacrificial love. Every Christian husband must sow sacrificial love and submission. Now how do we do this? Hmm? How do we do this? We do this by being selfless. We must prefer our wives over ourselves. We must love, cherish, nourish, adore, protect, willing to give our lives if need be for our wives. We are to always put them before ourselves. And if we do these things, husbands, we will reap. How will we reap? Our wives in turn will submit themselves unto us. In other words, they will in turn love us, cherish us, nourish us, adores us, and reverence us. Always remember that you will always reap whatever you sow. Husband, if you sow and continue to sow the same things that Jesus continues to sow concerning the church to your wife, you will constantly reap from your wife the same things Jesus are constantly reaping from his bride, the church. Jesus and the church is the pattern for Christian marriages. Now, let's look at the phrase, for the husband is the head of the wife. In what way? In what way? It is a love relationship, and the husband is to be the head for the sake of order. We see this clearly in 1 Corinthians chapter 11 and verse 3, which says, But I would have you know that the head of every man is Christ, and the head of the woman is the man, and the head of Christ is God. Now notice that God the Father is the head of Jesus Christ. This clearly shows here that headship deals with order. Jesus Christ is equal to the Father in every aspect. They are one. By the same token, the husband is the head of the wife for the sake of order. But they are equal in every aspect. They are one. Oh, glory to God, glory to God. You got to get that. Did you get it? If you didn't, rewind and listen to it again. It is imperative that husbands and wives understand the true pattern for their relationship. Chapter 6, verse 1. Children, obey your parents in the Lord, for this is right. 
honor thy father and mother, which is the first commandment with promise, that it may be well with thee, and thou mayest live long on the earth. And ye fathers, provoke not your children to wrath, but bring them up in the nurture and admonition of the Lord. Now, as children, we are commanded to obey our parents. And not only should we obey them, but we must also honor them. We are to esteem them highly. And if we do this, God will add more days to our lives. Then he instructs the father on how to deal with his children. He says, don't provoke your children to wrath. In other words, don't cause your children to rebel against you because of your injustice, loss of temper, undue severity, cruelty, favoritism, suppression, sarcasms, ridicules, or misuse or abuse of authority. Instead, train them in the way of the Lord. Now, nurture basically means training, denoting spiritual education. The word ammunition is instruction that points out one's responsibilities and duties. Fathers, train your children in the way of the Lord. Fathers, teach your children the good word of God. All right, verse 5. Servants, be obedient to them that are your masters according to the flesh, with fear and trembling, in singleness of your heart, as unto Christ, not with eye service or as men pleasers, but as the servants of Christ, doing the will of God from the heart, with good will, doing service as to the Lord and not to men, knowing that whatsoever good thing any man doeth, the same shall he receive of the Lord, whether he be bond or free. Now, Paul instructed the Christian slaves of his day to be obedient to their masters, and their obedience was to be with fear and trembling. Now, this doesn't mean to be scared or cringing before a master, but means to treat him with respect and dignity. In singleness of your heart means being one-faced, not being two-faced, not smiling in the employer's face and then stabbing him in the back while he, he is away. Such action should never be in the life of a Christian. The servant obedience is to be done as unto Christ. In other words, the slave was to labor for his master as if he was laboring for Jesus Christ. He is now all, he is now also the slave of Christ, and because of this, he is to look above the earthly master in his attempt to please his master in heaven. Verse 9. And ye masters, do the same things unto them, forbearing, threatening, knowing that your master also is in heaven. Neither is there respect of persons with him. Now, Paul gives instructions to the masters of slaves. He tells the Christian masters not to take advantage of their positions as masters. They were not to abuse their power or to threaten their Christian slaves. Because they too, like the Christian slaves, have a master to please to answer to. And because in Christ, both the master and his slave were equal. Galatians chapter 3 and verse 28 shows that both the bond and free were one in Christ. All right, verse 10. Finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. Put on the whole armor of God that ye may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. For we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. Wherefore, take unto you the whole armor of God, that ye may be able to withstand in the evil day, and having done all, to stand. Paul says here that we must be strengthened in the Lord and in the power of his might equipped with the whole armor of God so that we can successfully war against the devil and all his forces. Look at verse 14. Stand out for having your loins girt about with truth and having on the breastplate of righteousness and your feet shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace. Above all, taking the shield of faith wherewith ye shall be able to quench all the fiery darts of the wicked. And take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God. Now, Paul lists six pieces of God's armor in this passage. Number one, we must have on our spiritual belt, which is the knowledge 
of the truth of Scripture. Number two, the breastplate of righteousness, which represents a holy character and moral conduct. Number three, preparation of the gospel of peace. In other words, an eagerness or willingness to advance against the devil and to take the fight to him. We take the fight to him when we spread the gospel of peace to the world. Number four, the shield of faith means taking God at his word by believing his promises. Such trust will protect one from doubts induced by Satan. Number five, the helmet of salvation. This is the hope of our salvation. Every believer has to know that their salvation is eternal. Hallelujah. Number six, the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God. We know that is the word of God. My God, my God. Look at verse 18. Praying always with all prayer and supplication in the spirit and watching thereunto with all perseverance and supplication for all saints. Listen, every prayer and supplication must be prayed in the spirit. In the spirit signifies that with the spirit's help, such prayer for divine aid is to be made. Watching thereunto means being vigilant in this very matter of prayer. And we are not to pray for ourselves only, but for all saints. Because spiritual combat is both an individual and corporate matter. Look at verse 19. And for me that utterance may be given unto me that I may open my mouth boldly to make known the mystery of the gospel for which I am an ambassador in bonds that therein I may speak boldly as I ought to speak. Paul requested prayer for himself that God would increase his boldness to declare the mystery of the gospel. Now what is the mystery of the gospel? The mystery of the gospel is that God has also included the Gentiles into his fold. God started with only the nation Israel, but he has since then broken down the walls of partition and have engrafted the Gentiles in. The church is now made up of both Jews and Gentiles. He needed more boldness. You have to understand the time that he was living in. He needed more boldness to preach that because many Jews refused to believe that the Gentiles was on equal footing with them. Look at verse 21. But that ye also may know my affairs and how I do. Tychicus, a beloved brother and faithful minister in the Lord, shall make known to you all things whom I have sent unto you for the same purpose, that ye might know our affairs and that he might comfort your hearts. Peace be to the brethren in love with faith from God the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Grace be with all them that love our Lord Jesus Christ in sincerity. Amen. As Paul's letter to the Ephesian Christians come to a close, he says, Grace be with all them that love our Lord Jesus Christ in sincerity. He uses the word grace. Grace is the key word of the epistle. Paul begins the letter with grace in Ephesians chapter 1 and verse 2. It is the subject of the epistle in Ephesians chapter 2 verses 7 and 8. Then he concludes the epistle with it. It is a fitting word because it is God's grace which saved us and which sustains us today. This concludes our studies on the book of Ephesians.